of such an amazing uh, gathering uh, here and to take a dive into the cutting edge in the future of health and medicine. Whose first uh, future medicine, exponential medicine conference is this? Wow. Whose first Singularity University event is this? Wow. Okay. So we're in for a fun ride. Um, we're going to get a chance to sort of dive into the cutting edge and future of healthcare from a whole bunch of, of different angles. And um, we sometimes joke that SU, Singular University, is sometimes sleepless university. So it's going to be a bit of a, a long four days in many ways, but I encourage you to really mix it up and dive in. So, you know, as we look at all the technologies emerging, it's a really interesting time to think about not the individual elements, but how they sort of come together to affect our individual health and wellness and prevention, to the future of diagnosis, uh, how we can do more targeted precision and personalized therapy, how we can globalize uh, many technologies to impact global health, and discovery, how we can all play a role in the future of clinical trials and improving healthcare. But in many ways, if you look at health and medicine, sometimes it feels like we're in the, in the past or, you know, back in the quasi-future, and you remember two weeks ago, it was Back to the Future week. Uh, it was the actual date in the future uh, where um, this guy came around. I'm still waiting for my hoverboard, and the Cubs didn't quite make it uh, to the World Series. Um, but uh, it's interesting to look at the past with a lens um, of what people used to think the future looked like. Um, and uh, we'll have some folks here from Kaiser later, but there are old, established, very, in some cases, innovative organization who made this little movie about what they thought the future was going to look like back in the 1950s. Take a look. A medical dream comes true under the drive of industrialist Henry Kaiser, who holds the plans of the ultra-modern hospital designed by Dr. Sidney Garfield, director of the Kaiser Foundation. From the admissions office on, everything is streamlined and expedited. The patient's record reaches the doctor before he does. This is the last word in a combination X-ray machine and fluoroscope imported from Holland at a cost of $25,000. Every portion of the body through 180 degrees can be photographed. In the operating room, the first light of its kind is installed. No portion of an operation is ever in shadow. Nor is the expectant father forgotten. Here he can get the news officially and suffer under the most comfortable circumstances possible. And for mother, well, she has only to call for her baby, and baby comes sliding through a wall in a draw-like bassinet for a little visit with the new mother. In this $2 million institution, doors are opened by remote control, and on the single floor, patients are easily moved from place to place. Dream grounds for a dream hospital. The answer to a doctor's prayer. Great answer to a doctor's prayer. It's not the patient's prayers necessarily. I'm sure all your uh, hospitals have hot tubs and pools for the doctors. Um, so I was fortunate to train in medical school at Stanford, went over to, to Boston for residency at Mass General. I've uh, been back there for, for several visits uh, to uh, look at sort of where healthcare has uh, changed uh, in the almost 20 years since I was an intern and was back in the trenches. And, you know, I go back and visit the old wards, and in some ways it's like it hasn't changed. I have a little PTSD when I show up there. Um, same alarms, some of the same patients, some of the same nurses. Um, only difference is that the poor interns pushing around a cart, typing the medical record, printing it out, putting in the paper chart, and the front desk is still using the cutting edge medical communication tool of our day, the fax machine, right? And so in many of our great institutions, you, you know, we're still practicing healthcare in old models, old ways of thinking, old silos, whether it's medicine, pharma, devices, other fields. And we have a chance in this new exponential age, this digital age, this genomics age, to get out of the bucket of body parts and subspecialties to rethink and reimagine healthcare, which is the theme of exponential medicine, what I hope all of us will be doing in these next few days. And to shift the lens from sort of the sick care equation to a real healthcare equation, switching it from episodic and reactive to continuous and proactive. Because today, most of our data is sort of stuck. The feedback loops are broken. You might get an occasional lab value of blood pressure, EKG. You might fax your numbers or scribble them down on a piece of paper and send them to your primary care doctor. And therefore, we're very reactive. We wait for the heart attack, the, the, the stroke, or the lump to be discovered at, at stage three or four. And we're still in the model of waiting weeks for the doctor visit, 36 minutes on average for the 12-minute visit, whether you're here in San Diego or in Calcutta. Those models and thinking in healthcare are set to shift and be changed in many ways. And it's not just change and disruption through technology, it's really often more the incentives and culture that are so critical. You know, here in the US, we practice not evidence-based medicine, but reimbursement-based medicine. We're now starting to shift to this Evident, this incentive-based, um, uh, value-based care system. And again, it's those incentives and, and ways of thinking that are going to shift with technology the future. 
We're shifting where healthcare happens, to never admit someone to the hospital in the first place, to send them home earlier, and to bring technology onto our homes and into our bodies. Internet of Things coming to the Internet of, of Healthcare. And part of the shift is the increasing in power of the consumer. They have new transparency to compare one hospital to another, one drug to another, Yelps for dr Yelp systems for drugs. For many of you in pharma, what are the real people in the world thinking about how they're using them? We can start to even score surgeons for, for better or for worse, comparing individual hospitals and individual physicians and their outcomes per procedure. So it's an interesting, brave new world as this emerges, um, and it provides opportunities and complexities. As we move forward, we're in the theme of exponentials here, especially exponential medicine, and just a brief recap on that. Of course, we're all familiar with Moore's Law and the power of computation. The smartphones in our pockets have about a billion times the speed and performance of the best supercomputers in the 70s. The tablets on your, lap, on your laps are more powerful than a Cray supercomputer in the 1990s. And this disruption is not coming just with Moore's Law, it's many technologies, and we want to sort of be riding that, that wave and seeing where it's heading in the next two to five years or 10 years in healthcare where we can start to really shift things. But it's hard for all of us to think exponentially. Our brains are leveraged or wired kind of linearly. I'll take 30 linear steps, I'll, I'll be the exit sign. But if I'm taking exponential steps, doubling every step, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, by the 15th step, 32,000. But by that 60th step, or 30th, 30th day, I'm at a billion. That's 26 times around the planet. And that's the power of exponentials that are sometimes hard to kind of grok, you know? It's why our desktop from 2000 fits on our smartphone, now fits on our smart watch, and is now shrinking to the size of a computer the size of a grain of rice, bringing again that connectome, that internet of things, internet of, of healthcare. And it's disappearing devices. So as we think exponentially, it certainly plays a role in medicine. We're in this, often what's called digital health, or mobile health, or connected health. I think, in a sense, those are all buzzwords. Soon it's just gonna be called health and medicine. But if we take the lens of where fast-moving technologies are going, particularly in the amounts of big data that are emerging and other realms, we have the opportunity to think not about just Moore's Law, but about the convergence of all these technologies coming together. So I think the theme of exponential medicine and Singularity University is really super convergence and riding that exponential wave to create new thinking uh, in health and beyond. And if we have that new thinking, we can address some of these grand challenges we have, particularly in healthcare, rising costs, aging demographic, access to care. We have accountable care uh, here, but a shortage of primary care physicians and specialists in most parts of the country. We're in the era of big data. We'll talk a lot about big data in this element, but how do we make that small data, actionable information for you as a clinician, for your patient, for your family? How do we lower the costs that are uh, often from inefficiencies, or repeating tests and faxing forms? And how do we work together with the regulatory bodies, our friends at the FDA, EMA, to understand exponentials in, in developing trials and getting things to market? And our friends, many of you here from the payer world, how do you value these elements? So lots of opportunities for change. We've seen these changes and disruptions in many fields around it in the last just decade. Um, everyone likes to cite the example of Uber. How many, how many people took an Uber to get here? Good number, right? That's only a six-year-old company. Um, if you think about it, it didn't invent the smartphone, which is only seven years old. Then invent online maps, GPS, online payments. They connected the dots and have transformed that industry. And even Uber themselves did a little pilot called Uber Health, where they could press a button and a nurse would come and give you a flu vaccine. So that sensibility, that sort of lowering of barriers, is not just what the digital natives want, we all sort of want that. There's five or more kind of Ubers for Health that have launched in the last year, even some using coverage of, of insurance, where you'll be able to press a button and a doctor will come to your house or apartment within three hours. Not sure what kind of doctor, but you get a doctor. And remember, they can rate you and you can rate them, so that transparency element is there. And your drugs can be delivered seamlessly. Um, so disruption and change is coming. Many of you are in the pharma world. We're layering that with digiceuticals and beyond. Our goal here this week is to become the disruptor, not the disruptee, and bring some of that new thinking and connection and, and synergies together. So as Will mentioned, I've been really uh, honored and blessed to be the track chair of medicine since Singularity was started in 2009. And um, there's tracks, and you'll met many of our chairs, from biotech, robotics, AI, digital manufacturing, and beyond. And we look at the impact of these technologies and how we bring them into the world. And what's been interesting in our summer programs um, about half of the projects started by folks outside of medicine and biotech have ended up being focused in healthcare. And when we started Singularity University, we had some, some more sort of general executive programs, but because so many folks were interested in health and medicine, we started this program back in 2011, first called Future Med, now Exponential Medicine, to bring extraordinary folks like you together and mix it up. You know, we started small, we've now more than doubled exponentially, and we're here in this amazing setting. And some amazing new companies have started, new thinking. And one of my sort of goals for all of you is to meet a lot of people you don't know and to create uh, the future together. So let's now sort of take a dive um, into uh, some of these different elements. Um, first of all, health and prevention. If we can spend more time of our energy and focus there, 
tremendous opportunities for ourselves individually, for, for our patients, for our, our communities. You know, we know now that while our genetics is important, we'll talk a lot about omics and genomics here, it's our behaviors that are much more impactful for our, our long-term health. And it used to be the model where, you know, you go to your doctor, the doctor was God. You know, physicians might have liked that. But the new drug is really the empowered, engaged patient. The e-patient, like e-patient Dave, who we had here on faculty last year, or the patients included, started by our friend and colleague Lucy Englund, who's here in faculty as well. This idea that we can all start to be the solution, and the empowered drug is going to be the empowered, engaged patient in, in, in collaboration with their healthcare team. Now, of course, we have new tools to be engaged with our health. How many folks here are wearing some sort of fitness tracker, right? Bunch of you, I'm wearing like seven right now, okay? You know, a bit of a so what. I'm sure many of you have lost them or lost the battery and, you know, uh, they're in a drawer somewhere. But, you know, I would argue that we're moving from the sort of consumerized, quantified self world to this world of quantified health. Well, these sorts of technologies are going to be embedded in all sorts of our environments from prevention, diagnostics to therapy. We're moving from, you know, sensors 1.0, this sort of simple accelerometer that used to be thousands of dollars for, for a, a few dollars in our wrists, to sensors 3.0, to these things ubiquitously in our environment, to RFIDs that are in our, our pills. We're going from the world of you know, wear wearables to insidables, another term from Lucy England. You know, uh, Google, for example, uh, making contact lenses in partnership with Novartis that you wear that it will soon track the blood sugar for diabetics, or to hearables, or to this idea of trainables. You know, wouldn't it be nice to have feedback for your posture, which I kind of need, right? A little nanny on your back, you wear this for a week, your posture improves, you stop wearing the app. Those sorts of feedback elements are coming. And these consumer devices are becoming medicalized, from rings that can track your sleep to other devices that will do real-time blood pressure. Um, we're seeing them embedded in our clothes and our cars, you know, starting with the sports world, but even coming to the pediatric world. And I'm trained in as a pediatrician as well. This used to be an artifact from the future from Wired Magazine, but last year, Huggies came out with Tweet Pee, you know, so sometimes more data than we might want, or um, data for number two as well, uh, sometimes helpful, um, or connected onesies. Um, my son, Leo, will be here this week. This is about a year ago. He's doing his part for medicine, wearing his connected onesie. Didn't really need that to tell me he was waking up every two hours, but these sorts of technologies are going to start to infuse. The trick, again, is how to layer them into our healthcare system, into the workflow of the physician. If the temperature shows up on the binky, uh, unless it flows back to the mother or the, the pediatrician, it's a bit of a so what. We have other things we can quantify in interesting ways, from our breath, from breathometers that'll track our alcohol level. If it's too high, it locks us, out, locks us out of our car and calls an Uber. Or the new ones that can track the quality of your breath or your hydration. Folks are developing nano noses to pick up uh, evidence of cancer from your breath. Lots of new ways diagnostics are emerging. Even our voice. You know, psychiatry is ripe for disruption. We'll have a session on neuro and psychiatry later. Your voice and the timbre of it can be really interesting. This will be one of our companies in our demo room. Here's poor, poor Tom Brady. It doesn't matter what he's saying. You know, I didn't do it. The software can pick up his emotional state. Pain, vulnerability, need to fight, possibly self-pity, right? And you don't need to be, uh, you can actually download this yourself and try it out and see if your spouse is really angry at you or not. So, um, new things that you can start to quantify. Our phones can be a center for, for, for mobile health. Our Wi-Fi is going to start becoming uh, sensors. MIT published earlier this year, Wi-Fi can pick up seamless uh, vital signs from multiple people in the same room. So, we're entering this interesting era, for better or for worse, where our digital exhaust is going to be continuous. Exponential amounts of terabytes of data streaming from us. What does it mean? How do we make this actionable and useful? Um, are we going to get to an era of sort of a Google Now for our health? A little bit of a GPS for healthcare. You know, Daniel, go right to the gym, not left to the fast food restaurant. Um, we're starting to see simple elements. My watch now, because sitting is the new smoking, uh, reminds me to stand up. But it's not always contextual. It doesn't know if I'm driving or flying in an airplane. And I'll start to see these sort of coaches come on sometimes interesting places. I, I do encourage you to unplug while you're here and in general. But we'll start to get this data in interesting places. Um, and the opportunity is how, again, we're going to use it. Um, because we need to integrate this. It's only been in the last year since our last exponential medicine that companies like Google and Apple with Apple Health, the data can flow through your smartphone into the cloud and now recently into your EMR. EMR will have some leaders from institutions starting to build uh, connections between mobile devices, Apple, and their electronic medical record and share some of those results. We're seeing big companies that look at lots of data start to make sense of what the actual data means. And Again, we know, no one wants to log into 10 different apps or APIs. We want sort of an integrated score, maybe a FICO score for our health, a wellness in this to kind of nudge us in the right directions to help coach us because we know behavior change is hard. What do these data trends mean uh, for a clinician looking at the information, for a, a mother, a patient themselves? I like to call this predictalytics. Where is this data taking us? What does it mean that we should do, again, proactively? 
I think the best summary um, is kind of like our modern cars. Our modern cars have three or 400 sensors in them. You don't care about any one sensor. You care about when your check engine light goes on. And that sensor is integrating multiple elements of analytics and sensors. And it's different from different cars. And now these are going to become commoditized, and it's going to be sort of like on-star systems for the body that integrate this and make sense of it. And if you run into a tree, you can call 911. Or if you're low on oil, can guide you to the nearest mechanic. And I think that sort of sensibility, and we'll hear more about self-driving cars and more, has lessons for healthcare. One of the companies that started here at Exponential Medicine, Century, and is doing that sort of thing with signals from the home. We'll hear more from them. But again, it's not about the data, it's how you put it together. And in the world of behavior change, how do we use this to coach ourselves? We'll hear from the founder of Lark later tomorrow. How do you kind of coach and ping, kind of like a her for healthcare? It even knows, for example, that I got, I'm jet lagged and didn't sleep enough and can um, nudge me in the right directions. We'll see more of that infusing and, and helping individuals tune their health and medicine. We'll see mirrors of you, the future you. When you look in the mirror in the morning and you're trying to lose weight, you might be inspired by future you. Or if you're really working out or you're on the Navy, beach with the Navy SEALs, future you. Um, what if you keep having donuts for breakfast? You know, future you. That's kind of a thing that might rewire our brain. And you don't need to wait for the magic mirror. There are apps now where here's me now, here's me a thousand donuts later. You know, yikes, I, I, I skip the donuts in the morning. Or what if you have a patient who's smoking and you can show what her face looks like? This new world of augmented reality has really tremendous opportunities to reshape thinking for individuals and beyond. Or if you're spending too much time on Facebook, what happens? Other, other issues, right? Um, and we're going to hear more about augmented and, uh, and virtual reality here today. Uh, we have physicians here who met the Google Glass team at our, first, our second program, and we're the first to take that into the clinic. That plays a role for clinicians, for patients. Um, we'll have folks from Microsoft maybe talking about HoloLens and how that's being used to, to leach anatomy. We'll be able to try virtual reality here in our innovation lab. All sorts of tremendous op opportunities there from low-cost versions as well. You can all have this essentially in your pocket and innovate on this in interesting ways. Uh, we'll, we have from London, Shafi Ahmad, who's been innovating this in the operating room. We'll hear more about using this for training surgeons. So lots of things to discover as converging technologies can apply to healthcare. Part of health and prevention, of course, is our understanding our personal genomics. We're now in the age where the price of sequencing is dropping at twice the rate of, rate of Moore's law. You know, what happens when someone presents, you know, here's Raymond McCall, you know from later, his genome on a disk drive. If I'm his doctor, how do I make sense of this data? We're starting to see early applications like pharmacogenomics, even from your $100 23andMe test that could be used in the clinic. Here's a list of, of all my drugs. There are now app platforms that are being developed for genomes. We're seeing companies like this one where you can upload your genetic information and look at your athletic abilities. So here's my data. I was a good sprinter, high metabolic efficiency, lousy cross country, endurance kind of low. I want to get up in the morning and do my beach run, but I have trouble getting out of bed, but I have an excuse. My motivation genes are low, as you see on the left. <laughs> So interesting ways of taking complex data and making it useful. And of course, we're going well beyond the genome now, the proteome, 10,000 biomarkers from your, your blood, the exposome, where we've lived, the microbiome we'll be talking more about here, the implications for having 10 times more bacterial cells on in our, in our body than human cells, and the role they play in everything from obesity to inflammatory bowel disease to psychiatric disorders. At my old home base of Boston Children's, we're trying to do fecal transplants. You know, these will be new therapeutics where you'll get two microbiomes. You may even be banking your stool before you take a course of, of antibiotic. Other old school technologies are really important. Uh, we have Swami here who will be leading meditations. These are old technologies that we can now have new ways of leveraging in modern healthcare and seeing how they impact our brain and our bodies. So things like our brain can now be tracked with consumer devices. We'll have the founder of Interaxon here looking at how you can track mindfulness and beyond, as well as the founder of Think looking at ways of hacking your brain and applying energy to it. We'll look at advanced brain-computer interfaces. Some of these simple versions have been used for kids with ADHD to learn to focus and play a game and, and get off of their, their, uh, their drugs, for example. Might even be good for adults. We'll have um, my uh, friend and old roommate from Brown University, Dr. Lee Hochberg, tomorrow night is the keynote, talking about brain-computer interfaces. Not just enabling the disabled, but in some cases even super-enabling that and taking that to the next level where we're going to have really interesting implications for those of us who are normally abled or disabled. And we're seeing even video games, as last year Adam Gasly highlighted, play a role in improving our cognition or treating, treating mental disorders and starting to tie those with video games in really interesting ways. If you, and if you think about the cutting edge and future of healthcare, a lot of it is around gaming and getting feedback and data and making it engaging and moving forward. How about the future of diagnosis? You know, I'm trained as a pediatric oncologist. We know in cancer we pick up folks often late stage, three or four. What if we could start to pick up diseases earlier? We'll have a whole session on neuroscience. Um, we'll be looking at elements of picking up disease early, whether it's using PET scans or blood-based biomarkers or uh, tablet-based uh, eye tracking to pick up Alzheimer's or patients likely to get Alzheimer's 10 or 20 years early. Then maybe some of the drugs that are being developed 
and trials that can stop and reverse plaques can be used at stage zero, just like we use statins for folks at risk of cardiovascular disease. And the diagnostic landscape is dramatically changing. You know, you can have a whole set of tools, you know, in your pocket that you can leverage from dermatoscopes to blood pressure cuffs uh, to, you know, we'll have this company in our lab that takes an old-fashioned stethoscope and makes it a digital version. We're having a whole diagnostic kit shrink into single devices. We're having, again, not just a dermatology in your, dermatologist in your pocket, but tying to AI and analytics to make sense of those pictures. Is that a melanoma or a mole? We're seeing them done for uh, colposcopy. We're seeing them uh, develop as ultrasounds that'll attach to your smartphone. You know, you can uh, Facebook your ultrasound right away. You know, it might be interesting. Um, we're seeing the disruption of eye care from the old-fashioned version to ones that can be attached to your smartphone. Uh, a great early version of uh, digital health is the smartphone EKG case, right? It can diagnose atrial fibrillation. It can be used for screening. Uh, the new version will do six leads. I was with the founder of this a couple weeks ago, Dr. Dave Albert. Here's what he has up to next. This is the pilot. Take a look. So, Dr. Kraft, go ahead and touch it and, my EKG. and hold it. And now you also annotate it. So if you were feeling bad, you skip beat, short of breath, chest pain, you would be talking to it at the same time it's recording your electrocardiogram. And so that's all happening today. And so as soon as you finish that, you press save, and now it will process the ECG, display it, then use the digital crown to scroll through it, uh -huh. then use force touch to play the audio, and that will bring it up. There you go, there I am, help and, me doctor. And there it is. So I can get context, I can say I'm having chest pain, have the EG, and this will eventually go right to the cloud. And, right it to also, and it also takes all your heart rate and activity data since the last recording to really say, did I start to slow down? Has my heart rate become irregular? So, so it, you get the picture. These are shrinking. What do you do with this data? We'll have a company here back again, Vital Connect, that makes a little uh, patch that I'm wearing right now. It can track my, uh, my, my EKG, my stress level, which is probably 102% this year, uh, my posture. That's um, ICU level data streaming to you anywhere you can log in and have internet or phone access. That's a tremendous opportunity to shift inpatient care, outpatient care, uh, and health and wellness. We're gonna have uh, looks at, let's say you pick up heart disease in a patient. We'll have the CEO of HeartFlow here tomorrow looking at now doing CT-based angiogos, replacing the old-fashioned uh, 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 angiogram and doing that in the cloud. This convergence of cloud-based computing uh, to understand the patient's blood vessels. Do they need, a, do they need a, a bypass or do they need a stent? And maybe soon we'll start to even 3D print and personalize stents for individual patients. Or another Stanford company, spin out Arteris, which can do a four-minute cardiac MRI and give you all the data and more than you get in echocardiogram. So tremendous ways now to visualize and integrate in diagnostics. Part of these new diagnostic tools are being incentivized by, by new thinking. Um, Peter DeManis, as you heard, uh, started the XPRIZE. He'll be here uh, on Wednesday night, and we'll hear from the XPRIZE tomorrow. Um, how do we build incentives, like for the medical tricorder, based on Star Trek? And over 400 teams entered this XPRIZE, sponsored by Qualcomm down the street, to build a real-life tricorder. One of them started in 2011, our first future medicine company uh, uh, conference, and now they just shipped, as part of a clinical trial, 10,000 of these devices. You hold them to your forehead, it pulls down to your smartphone, your heart rate, your temperature, calculates your blood pressure. They're overlapping that with uh, co collaborations with IBM Watson. That's a lot of information. How do we empower the consumer to use this? Or to not have to go in and do a lab, uh, pee in a, pee in a cup in the lab, you can do it at home. Dip the urine stick um, and essentially use your smartphone as the analysis for that and send that to your doctor, to the CDC, to the NSA, who else wants it, right? Uh, maybe ones that you might want to use for flu season or Ebola season as well. So new ways of getting diagnostics at the point of care partly leveraged by this world of microfluidics, the lab on a chip, right? The idea of doing a blood biopsy as opposed to a tissue biopsy, which is starting to come to the oncology world. Or printing tests at the point of care, very important for potentially global health and democratizing elements. So a lot of this is overwhelming data analysis. We're gonna hear more from Neil Jacobson about AI and others. How do we shift this from just AI to IA, intelligence augmentation, that's gonna infuse all sorts of elements of our healthcare. We'll have folks from IBM Watson here. You know, now that they're partnering with big companies, this is gonna infuse all of our lives uh, and many interesting opportunities in healthcare. And speaking as a clinician, I'm hopeful that these technologies enable the patient-doctor relationship. We can get out of the way. We're not typing our notes all day for billing. We're gonna have new connectivity using these things. So what about the future of therapy? Um, many ways we want to be smaller, cheaper, better, and that's starting to happen, from pills you can swallow that can replace an upper endoscopy to the emerging area of gene therapy we'll talk about and synthetic biology. We're starting to enter an era uh, where we can replace genes and 
cure folks with sickle cell and thalassemia. We're seeing drugs and devices merge with electroceuticals, not just pacemakers for the heart, uh, but those that can pace your brain and your gut and your bowels. We're seeing some come to contraception, all right? Remote control for contraception. You know, interesting conversation. You know, honey, where's the remote? Or uh, what if someone hacks your remote or hacks your pacemaker? Lots of issues of privacy and, and data control and ownership. We're entering an era of prescribing meds uh, or apps as opposed to medications or layering them together um, for pre-op care, for post-op care that are going to be tuned to you. We're seeing the ROI from these. Mayo Clinic has used uh, a version to reduce heart failure emissions. And as the incentives change to preventing re-emissions, these things are coming to bear. We're entering, or you're quickly entering this era of virtual visits. Are you going to go to your clinician anymore or are you going to integrate them with your, your smartphone technology. One of the companies that started from two founders here, Curly, is doing asynchronous care on the smartphone. Check them out in the Innovation Lab. So it's an interesting time. You know, what's the role of the clinician going to be in the future? Um, I hope that we're going to integrate and work with these technologies and, and not be <laughs> replaced by them, right? Um, so uh, that's part of the question and the challenge. Robotics is playing a role, from robotic anesthesiologists to robotic surgery to those that will deliver trays and drugs to enabling the disabled. Um, we'll hear from folks from uh, 3D Systems later. You might notice that the exoskeleton that woman was wearing has 3D printed components. 3D, 3D printing, another amazing area that's starting to impact healthcare. Scott Summit will be here later. Would you rather there wear a cast or have one that's tuned and built exactly based on your own anatomy? Or um, we're seeing engaged patients, we'll have Stephen Keating here, who are using these sorts of tools to understand and even help their own clinicians um, do their operative uh, uh, interventions. We have Singularity University companies building 3D printers that they sent to the space station, which might be a difficult place to get a, a, a medical instrument ship, but you might be able to print it on the space station or in your operating room or clinic uh, in the near future. You can even, of course, 3D print yourself. I always carry a mini-me with me, you know, he's kind of cute, but it could be applied to our cancer patients in interesting ways. Um, we're starting to blend uh, um, stem cell biology and 3D printing of organs. Today, down the street, Organova is printing micro uh, organs, and they can use those for drug screening. Uh, we're making labs on a chip for doing early stages of preclinical trials. Uh, my new startup is uh, building 3D printed pills that are based on your anatomy and dosing, and eventually we'll print those out at home. And the hope for all these things is not that they're more expensive and less accessible, but can democratize healthcare, that can break down the boundaries. Because the poorest on the planet all have SMS phones today. Soon they'll have the equivalent of our smartphones and tablets. You know, Amazon's selling a $50 tablet today. They're going to get faster and cheaper. We're seeing Loon and projects from Google and others bring internet connectivity to the planet. And education, again, is power in healthcare. Another singular university company, Matternet, was the first to use drones to deliver things like drugs and vaccines after disasters and difficult to access worlds. So lots of things we can apply that are moving quickly into healthcare, whether it's delivering your drugs or maybe even a defibrillator. Um, Finally, discovery. We know, for example, clinical trials still take years, billions of dollars. How can we now leverage the cloud and mobile and new thinking to reinvent clinical trials, whether it's downloading a trial for cardiovascular disease or for Parkinson's and doing all the consents, using the phone as a sensor for voice or for tapping? Um, and how do we think about crowdsourcing and integrating those sorts of trials, that sort of new thinking? You know, when you drive with Google Maps or Waze, you share a little bit of your privacy, your speed and location, but in exchange, you get the map. This is a map of Rome being built in a day. And you now get the traffic and how to reroute yourself and where the cops are hiding out. What if we had that same sensibility to healthcare? What if all the amazing companies and innovators here started to crowdsource and share data and not keep it siloed? What if we all um, crowd med our medical diagnosis? And we'll hear from the founder on the last day as well. So we can all not just be drug, uh, sorry, we cannot all just be uh, blood and organ donors. We might think about being uh, data donors and collaborating in new empowering ways. And taking new thinking. Many folks come to this conference in Singularity who are not in healthcare. We can take thinking from other fields like aviation, and I've been a pilot for years and served in the Air National Guard. Lessons from the military and aviation have started to infuse healthcare from checklists to simulation, new ways we're educating patients, doctors, medical teams. There's simulators for everything these days, believe me. Um, so new ways of how do we educate the clinician of the future? How do we give ourselves air traffic control to see where the thunderstorms are for ourselves, our individual patients, and provide Again, situational awareness to the individual patient, doctor, uh, and healthcare team. So at Exponential Medicine, our goal is to get you thinking exponentially. It's sometimes hard, again, for our minds to wrap around that, realizing that we're sort of here on many parts of these curves. But what are we going to imagine that's here in one year, two years, five years? Where's the puck going? You know, as Wayne Gretzky, the famous hockey player, said, you want to skate to where the puck is going to be. Don't live in 2015. Start skating to 2017 and 20. And hopefully some of the ideas and technologies and people you meet here will infuse you with that sort of exponential thinking. And if we have that thinking, we bring it all together and think about the convergence, 
uh, and blending everything from design thinking to body sensing to omics to citizen science to feedback and AI, environmental sensors. Many of these we're going to talk about in depth over the next few days. I think we have a real opportunity to shift health and medicine from its sick care equation, episodic and reactive, to a much more proactive world where we're continuous and proactive with our data. And so it's our mission here in the next few days to shift healthcare. Even when I visited back to MGH a few months ago, it's now the innovation ward where I spent my uh, internship year. So innovation is spreading, and we have the opportunity to take exponential steps here, not linear ones. And realizing that things in our pocket and are in an innovation lab and many of you that you have developed, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. It's our mission to go out there and not predict the future, but create it together. So with that, welcome to Exponential Medicine. We're in for an amazing four days. Thanks for your time and attention, and um, let's go exponential. Thanks. Thank you.